All right. So Michael Quinn Patton, Patton uh, you are a founder and CEO of Utilization Focused Evaluation, uh, an independent organizational development and program evaluation organization, uh, authored numerous books on evaluation, obviously uh, principles focused evaluation, facilitating evaluation, developmental evaluation, utilization focused evaluation, more recently Blue Marble evaluation and and of course, uh, Essentials of uh, Utilization Focused Evaluation, a book that we're going to be using for our, our class, uh, published also in a qualitative research of a book on qualitative research also. Um, you've edited and contributed numerous articles, books, uh, including several volumes of New Directions and a wide variety of, of subjects related to evaluation and other uh, important areas as well including feminist evaluation and uh, valuing utilization of evaluation. You're the president of AEA in uh, 88 and remain very active in the organization and certainly a leader in the evaluation field. Um, you also have uh, a, super, a superb taste in music. Um, I can attest uh, to that. And I think you are also a fellow backpacker too, or at least uh, outdoors uh, a person as a, uh, evidenced by the book uh, you wrote on your experience in the Grand Canyon. And uh, I have I've covered a, it all. Yeah, I have a, uh, uh, that resonates for me. That was my first backpacking trip. That was uh, uh, many, many years ago. And uh, I've started going backpacking with my son. Um, first oh. And so that's, that was, uh, that, that, uh, that book is something that uh, was, was quite interesting to me. So um, yeah. Can I ask you, Michael, uh, can you explain uh, the essence of uh, utilization uh, focused uh, evaluation? Like when you people ask you about that or when you try to when you explain it sort of relatively quickly, like how, how do you how do you describe it? Yeah. It's actually fairly straightforward that you need to know who the evaluation is for and how they want to use it. And the only thing that makes that extraordinary is that uh, when I began this work nearly 50 years ago, evaluators determined what they thought people ought to know and did evaluations that they thought were important. They determined the questions, they controlled the process, and they put the findings out there expecting the world to be um, genuinely impressed by their wisdom and findings. And they usually turned out to be irrelevant. So uh, the, the basic notion is that that we're not the users. The evaluators are not the users. We're in service of the users. So we need to know who they are and what it is they're trying to find out and attend to that if in fact we want evaluations to be used. Uh, and that is one of the principal standards that the field has adopted is that evaluations ought to be used. Makes sense. So they were, the, they were done initially with the mindset of sort of a researcher um, yeah. In fact, the original language was evaluation research. You know, mm -hmm. In the U.S., uh, evaluation comes out of research. In most of the rest of the world, it comes more out of management um, and administration. In much of the world, it has more to do with accountability than knowledge generation. And so we've had more of a research tradition out of the United States, but both of those traditions end up having their downsides because they don't um, make evaluation use front and center. They have it done for other purposes. Okay. So you've, you've done work in developmental evaluation, principles of focused evaluation, blue marble evaluation most recently. Um, how do those fit in with uh, UFE? Uh, it's it's a great evaluation. question and an important one. Um, and each of the approaches that I've written about have come from working with intended users and finding that they needed something that wasn't already there. So in the case of developmental evaluation, I was working with a philanthropic foundation on a contract that, that was a five-year contract, two and a half years formative evaluation, two and a half years summative. They really loved the formative evaluation. And they were adapting, changing. And then we got to the summative evaluation period. And I said, you can't make any more changes because everybody henceforth has to experience the same intervention. 
And they said, look, what we've learned is we're a leadership program. We have to constantly be changing. Um, is formative and summative all you people have? And that's pretty much what we had. And so I said somewhat defensively, well, we could uh, do developmental evaluation. And they said, what's that? And I said, that's where you keep on developing. And they said, why didn't you tell us about that sooner? And I said, well, um, we're telling you about it now. And uh, <laughs> it's the true story of how I came to the, this whole niche, which has turned out to be huge. Mm -hmm. um, some people think it's the biggest development and evaluation in the last decade of doing ongoing adaptive evaluation that's not model-based um, and is not improving a model. It is really adapting to complexity, turbulence, dynamic systems, which is what much of the world experiences and is certainly front and center in the coronavirus. Yeah, yeah definitely. Principles focus came out of developmental because if, you, if you're not following a model, um, what are you following? If you're not navigating according to some kind of, of concrete set of steps that you're supposed to follow, and you'll see this in it's become a centerpiece of the essentials of utilization focused evaluation is after each chapter, I talk about how complexity changes our understanding of things. It's not a linear process. We have to keep circling around. And how do you do that? Um, well, it turns out that, that programs that are, are dynamic, are driven by principles focused leaders, um, doing principles focused kinds of interventions Principles focused evaluation is what's appropriate. It looks at their adherence to the principles, the meaningfulness and where those take them. Um, and it was working with principles in complexity that led me to, I began working with people dealing with the climate crisis. And um, that's a complex dynamic system. It is global in nature. And so Blue Marble evaluation was working with those intended users who are dealing with climate change uh, and trying to make sense of that. So intended users for developmental evaluation are social innovators, intended users for principles focused evaluation are principles driven leaders and program directors, and the intended users for blue marble evaluation are people working on global issues like climate change and the pandemic. Okay, great, really helpful. Um, what, what would you say is emphasized in utilization focused evaluation that's not as emphasized in other evaluation approaches traditionally at least or uh, yeah. well the thing that led to this was i was directing a uh, an evaluation methodology program at the university of minnesota in the 70s one of the first such programs ever and i had the people in my seminar as a way of providing coherence to it do research on use. We interviewed people about evaluations, program managers, evaluators. And what we turned up was what I came to call the personal factor. That what, that what mattered was that individuals cared and that, um, that basically information, findings, knowledge is used by people. And m the entire evaluation field was based upon the notion that organizations use information, that institutions. So mm -hmm. people do, do evaluations for Congress. And my response is Congress doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Congress can't do shit. Uh, Congress is, is, uh -huh. is an artifact. Um, people. So who are the committee heads? Who are the, who are the, the staff who are going to take stuff to their congressperson, right, right, right. Uh, who, who are the board members, who are the directors, that, that you have to connect with people and the, the facade of I'm providing information to a board or an institution or, or to something else keeps them from dealing with who are the people who are going to use the information and how I connect with them. It seems pretty obvious, but, you know, kind of in retrospect, kind of looking back, but that was not the the mindset of the field by any stretch. And it's still not. Mm -hmm. If you look at most evaluations, they are contracted to serve an institution and they get framed as if an institution was going to be the user. Huh. They disguise A who the people entity. are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so in psychology and uh, like in clinical psychology, we have, you know, different uh, a lot of, uh, many practitioners will use multiple models, kind of integrate them together in terms of how they'll work with uh, individuals, families, couples. Um, in evaluation, is, is 
Utilization focused evaluation, is that something you can use in concert with other models that are out there, aside from the ones you just mentioned, which, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I actually don't present it as a model. I present it as a decision-making framework to decide what you're going to do. And part of that decision is what evaluation model you would use. So it, it actually, I treat utilization focused evaluation as an umbrella framework that, that helps you make decisions uh, about any model that may be relevant. So you may find that the intended users want theory-driven evaluation, want feminist uh, evaluation, want empowerment evaluation. Every evaluation model is a possible approach within utilization focused evaluation if that's what you've determined is appropriate for those users and the issues that they're trying to take on. So in that sense, it is a decision frame, not a model itself. Um, it's, it's, it's methods free, it's methods agnostic, it's methods uh -huh. eclectic, it's methods inclusive. And it's model eclectic, model inclusive. You can do any kind of evaluation. In fact, part of the challenge for utilization focused evaluators is they have to know that full repertoire. They have to be able to present the options. Facilitating a utilization focused evaluation requires you to know a large repertoire of possible approaches and methods to present to intended users so that they can decide what's relevant. That, that's really helpful. Thanks for, for making that super clear there. Okay. Um, what are, what are some, uh, strategies or tactics that you found through the years that, uh, you found to be especially helpful to engage users in evaluation, uh, projects? Uh, I know it's a very general question and, uh, but maybe a, a specific example would be helpful. Um, yeah. Well, the, the, the thing that, that limits use in many ways is evaluators approach interactions with intended users in formulaic and jargony ways. So early on, evaluation was defined as goal attainment. And so if I, if I was gonna work with, with uh, people about an evaluation, I would begin by saying, what are your goals and how do you measure your goals? Um, or a theory-driven evaluator will assume a program theory or construct a program theory. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, to get away from that, what, what I do, and the thing that works best for me in facilitating evaluation, and I've written a book about evaluation facilitation, mm -hmm. is to focus in on asking people, what don't you know that if you did know would make a difference to what you do? What don't you know that if you did know would make a difference to what you do? So they often know how well they're doing in goals, but mm -hmm. they don't know why people are dropping out. They may have uh, a program theory, but they don't know how participants um, are experiencing different degrees of dosage and what, what level of engagement with the program, since people don't all engage at the same level, what's the level of engagement with the program that makes a difference? Um, how much do people have to be in it to say we get, they got enough of the dosage that you would expect outcomes? What are the unanticipated consequences? What are side effects? What are the most important things people are taking away from a program? Another go-to question. Um, I find over and over again, and this will resonate with you psychologically, um, is that, that regardless of the type of program, when I ask of participants, the open-ended question, what's the most important thing you've gotten out of this program? Always in the top three, more often than not, the number one thing they say they got out of the program were relationships with other people, regardless of the content of the program. Uh -huh. Early childhood people, parents attending early childhood form relationships with other parents, and that makes a huge difference to them. They have their kids meet other kids. So, right. And relationships are virtually never a part of the logic model or the theory of change of programs. It's interesting. So they all have in common that they're, they're human beings. Basically. That's right. Yeah. And that, that's, that makes a difference. And so you can run a program to take advantage of that, reinforce it and build on it, or you can be clueless about it and miss what's actually happening to people. Good point. Um, are there, are there lessons from the social sciences research uh, uh, literature that inform your evaluation work in terms of your practice and what you do? Are you, 
uh, again, a broad question as well, but maybe there's something you could focus in on there. Well, you'll, you'll find in, in the essentials um, of utilization focused evaluation that uh, I, I draw a great deal upon a field called diffusion of innovations mm -hmm. and of, of socio, socio, sociology of change. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the 60s. That's how I avoided the Vietnam War, which is why I'm still with you. Um, and the, uh, when I came back to grad school, I got my doctorate in a new field at that time, which was the sociology of economic development, which um, drew heavily upon rural sociology, which at its centerpiece was how innovations are diffused. How do farmers adopt? It's the basis of the entire uh, extension service. Right. How do farmers adopt new things? That's turned into the whole field of innovations. How do you get people in technology, whatever, to adopt new things? And mm -hmm. it, it affects things like how you get uh, the population to go along with uh, social distancing. So the whole field of how do you get people to be to adopt information, knowledge use, diffusion of innovations, those larger fields, utilization focused evaluation is influenced by that entire arena. More recently, the decision sciences. How do we make decisions? Um, what are the things that interfere with rationality? Confidence heuristics, representative heuristics, anchoring heuristics that, that keep people from, from being able to make informed decisions because of biases and psychological predilection, predilections. So all of that, how do people decide things? How do they use information? How does innovation to change? How do things get adopted? Those are the fields that shape utilization focused evaluation. Great. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of reading there that we can do the diffusion of innovations uh, uh, work and the, that seminal book by, I think it's, was it Rogers or, or uh, Rogers, the, the 1966 diffusion yeah. of innovations and then Rogers and Schumacher uh, 1972 communication of innovations. Those are the classics. Right. In your essentials book, you, you cite a quote by Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, it's impossible for a man to learn what he thinks he already knows. Uh, great quote. What, what are common things you see to evaluators uh, sort of think that they already know, but probably don't? Well, I appreciate your picking up on that. The, one of the big challenges for evaluators is they think they know what the important questions are that users ought to ask. They, they come in with biases about what the important evaluation questions are based on their own values, based upon the evaluation literature. You ought to measure goal attainment. Um, you ought to measure implementation. You ought to measure impacts. Um, and, um, and so they operate out of a, a set of predispositions about what the important questions are and therefore don't ask what don't you know that if you did know it would make a difference to what you do because they think they already know what the questions are. That and that's question, what most textbooks tell them is what the questions are. Right, right. That question could go on a, a t-shirt and probably sell pretty well yes. at uh, AEA. So maybe give me a small commission for that. All right. So, um, <laughs> um, so what, what's the best way to learn uh, how to do evaluation? So what do you recommend to students and, beginning evaluators or even, you know, more advanced evaluators are kind of coming back to, to learning new things. What, what's the best way to kind of, you know, to, to get going? You have to do it. You have yeah. to do it. And I, yeah. I, I suggest that people, um, when I teach, they, they have to do projects, but that they, they find things um, to do that, that we're, we're asking, what don't you know that if you did know would make a difference to what you do because of the short time frame in a class um, that what you're looking for are, are questions, the add on to that. What don't you know that if you did know it would make a difference of what you do that we could find out in the next three weeks. Um, and, uh, and that takes you into some pretty simple stuff like why are people dropping out? What, what's the difference between people who complete the program and people who don't complete the program? Um, uh, what's, uh, what are the primary challenges that staff face that they feel they need help with? Um, what, uh, what are the things that people, when you're recruiting them, may get confused about what this program is? Mm -hmm. So you're focusing in on some pretty narrow questions. The other thing that, that I like to do, James, to have people learn it, is to um, 
is actually to evaluate their own decision making and their own um, their own actions. So when I'm working with a new group, um, one of the there are two kinds of questions I use uh, in facilitation for helping people learn. I'll take a group and ask each one of them to think about a recent major decision they made about something and ask them to share how they made that decision. Um, locating child care, I just had a group not long ago where there was made up of, of a bunch of folks in their 30s and like 90% of them were struggling with where to send their kid for child care. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a natural thing. So how do you, do, how do you evaluate? That. What were your criteria? How explicit were you about the criteria? How did you judge whether or not the criteria are being met? Uh, we're all making decisions all the time. Uh, was with a class of undergraduates for whom the biggest deal for them was either buying a computer or deciding how to, who to date. Uh -huh. uh, those are evaluation questions. Uh, I, in fact, the metaphor I use for developmental evaluation that people really get is I tell them that the metaphor for developmental evaluation is like dating. The outcome of a first date is whether there will be a second date. And then the outcome of a second date is whether there will be a third date uh -huh. and the out and so forth. And then at some point, the question becomes, are we dating? <laughs> and then at some point, the question becomes, are we in a committed relationship? Those are developmental steps. And you don't go out on the first date and say, let's get married and have children. You decide, do we want a second date? That's mm -hmm. developmental evaluation. And so um, I, I really try to make people aware we're all evaluators all the time. I do that when I, I'm, in, I'm in Minnesota, as you know. Yeah. This is the land where the last glacier melted. The state motto is a land of 10,000 lakes. 87% of the population goes fishing at least once a year. When I'm working with a group of Minnesotans, I don't start by talking about evaluation. I start by talking about how's fishing. Every issue in evaluation is in fishing. What's a good day fishing? What were you seeking? Um, mm -hmm. How many did you catch? You didn't catch anything? How was, well, we still were outdoors, had a great time. I say, yeah, we call that an evaluation goal displacement. You didn't hit the target you wanted, so you found out you hit some other target and you take credit for that. Um, Cost-benefit ratio. People are spending $40,000 on fishing equipment for something that costs $15 a pound in the supermarket. What's going on there? It's all in fishing. So we'll have a 20-minute discussion about fishing before making the segue to whatever the program is. To speak in terms that are relevant to your students, but also to the and what we uh, users. Do, what we do as a profession is we make that thinking process systematically. Everybody's doing evaluation all the time. They right. don't do it systematically. They don't do it consciously. And a word that you like coming up, they don't do it mindfully. Yeah. Well, that's the, the transition to the next one. I'm wondering if there is some relationship between potentially between, uh, in your view, between mindfulness and, and evaluation. Um, something that interests uh, me and for some time and, and uh, wondering, uh, wondering how the two might fit uh, together for you if they do at all. So one of the biggest developments in the last decade in evaluation is a recognition that people learning evaluative thinking often has a bigger, longer term impact than completing a particular evaluation. Evaluation findings get out of date very quickly. Right. Learning to think evaluatively, learning to think systematically, examine your criteria, examine the quality of data you're bringing to bear, getting inside your decision-making processes, becoming more intentional and thoughtful. Those are things that are embedded in evaluative thinking. And so we've been developing a substantial literature on that. A book that I came out with last year with a, with a philosopher, Elizabeth Minnick, is called Thought Work. Um, thinking, action, and the fate of the world. It's an edited volume of how different disciplines and professions approach thinking, systems thinking, strategic thinking, um, philosophical thinking, uh, business thinking, entrepreneurial thinking, philosophical thinking, evaluative thinking, um, and looking at the ways in which the, these different fields uh, work with people around 
thinking and becoming mindful of their thinking processes and mindful of the world in which they live in. And that is the essence increasingly of what we bring as evaluators, uh, not just producing findings, but engaging with people about being mindful of what they're doing and the world they live in and the consequences of that. Makes sense, yeah. I've been, I've been looking at the, uh, the, the special edition, uh, again, in, in working on this, uh, the, the evaluative thinking uh, one that came out, a, right. I don't know, is it now a couple of years ago? Yeah, a, a year and a half ago or so. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a nice relationship there, kind of a lot of... Uh, uh, you might want to have a look at, at thought work. It's two words, thought work, uh -huh. colon, thinking action in the fate of the world. Uh, I'm the co-author of that. And that's about uh, thinking across different disciplines. Elizabeth Minnick, my co-author, was a graduate student for Hannah Arendt, whose work you may know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the Elizabeth, you know, Hannah Arendt is the one who gave the world the phrase, the banality of evil. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth wrote a book that led to this book on thought work. She wrote a book three years ago called The Evil of Banality. <laughs> All very relevant today, as, as it ever has been. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, so uh, aside from the, the books that we talked about, um, are there other good resources? I know there's some, some great ch checklists, some uh, uh, on the Western Michigan site. There's a, one, you there's a, the evaluation flashcards I think you developed for mm -hmm. foundation. I don't remember which foundation, but uh, Brimmer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, other, you know, for people trying to get their head around, familiar with kind of, you know, a UFE. What, what would you? Uh, what are some other uh, resources or directions you can point them in? Well, there is a utilization focused evaluation website. Um, and it's linked to the Blue Marble Evaluation website, which actually is where more of the action is today. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the place that's becoming the go-to website for evaluation is Better Evaluation. Yeah. And they have a major uh, section devoted to utilization-focused evaluation and evaluation use more generally. Uh, and and their, their framework of how they've organized information on Better Evaluation has a whole... Um, menu item around evaluation use. Um, so they're, they're funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and some other funders. Patricia Rogers, an Australian evaluator, is the overall curator. And she's doing a tremendous job of bringing that up to date, keeping it up to date. And, that's, and their, their vision is to be the go-to place for evaluation resources. Yeah, fantastic resources. I use that. And it is, it is great. Okay, thanks. Uh, what, what uh, which uh, book or books do you uh, uh, find yourself giving as as gifts uh, to? You mean to my own or other books? Uh, your your uh, uh, other books, let's say, not your own books. How about that? Um, you know, I, I I I I can't think of having given anybody uh, a book actually. Uh, We're <laughs> recommending. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, I, I think that the, the book I recommend most often, and I have, as I think about it, have given it to some folks. Um, yeah. I, I think that the Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow yeah. that gets at how we make decisions. It's, it's now a decade old, hard to believe. But that whole body of work, and interestingly, he concludes, and it's still the case, with how little influence all of that work has had on economics mm -hmm. uh, or even psychology. But yet that is the best work about how we actually think as human beings um, and uh, prospect theory and the ways that uh, we interpret the world and, and, and establish probabilities. Um, it's, it's pretty dense, uh, but the, um, the related book is the one that Michael Lewis did about the relationship between Kahneman and Tversky. Uh -huh. uh, he did a, um, a book about their relationship, which is more accessible and actually talks about the paradigm shifting nature of their work, why it's, why it's so important. That's a very readable piece. It's, it brings their personalities into play. Um, 
And it's an incredible story of these, these guys who were both full professors at Hebrew University and they simply got paid to spend their days together. They didn't have any, they didn't do much teaching. They didn't have a research agenda they had to do. They published when they wanted to publish. And they spent long hours, totally different personalities engaging with each other, making up thought experiments, testing them out. So I think that whole arena um, is, is hugely important about how, what they've learned about how our heads work. And it can inform our work very much. Long walks, I think, they, they took with each other, daily walks, right? Is yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. And people would describe um, walking by their office all day long, hearing uproarious laughter. You know, uh, they both had big laughs and, and the door was closed and they'd just be in there laughing their heads off at each other. Oh, great, great, great suggestions there. Um, so uh, how should people stay in touch with you in the work that you're doing now? It's uh, uh, what's, where, where should they go? I, I, you've been doing some uh, webinars and some more work around with the Blue Marble evaluation, I think. Um, where, where, where are the places we should go to? Well, I, I, I've, through my, my daughter's come into the business and she's uh, helped get me to do tweeting. So um, I, I announced the songs on Twitter um, and um, uh, I do, I don't, I'm not active. I, I have announced stuff on Facebook and, and, uh, and LinkedIn, but um, there's a group of evaluators who are real active on Twitter um, who I enjoy and, and uh, so um, my uh, Twitter handle is M Quinn P. Okay. And, um, uh, and so I, I respond to things there and, and uh, post whatever my latest songs are and, and um, blogs. And, and uh, I've got a webinar I just posted that's uh, Wednesday for Claremont uh, mm -hmm. that they've decided to open up on, um, on leadership I'm doing. Um, I've been doing a series of webinars for Claremont and they've decided this final one to make open. So I just announced that on Twitter. Oh, great. So that'll be, uh, so, uh, and then you're also on LinkedIn as well, but you're more yes. active on Twitter. Okay. Got it. Great. I'm more, I post stuff on LinkedIn, but the, uh, Twitter is more interactive. Yeah. Great. Responding to other people's stuff and forwarding, uh, uh, Twitter gets real active during the AEA meetings, which probably won't happen this year. But um, that's where I started getting hooked in there. You've, it was a great way to find out what was going on in other sessions. At yeah. the American Evaluation Association meetings, there are 50 sessions going on at any one time. And Twitter became a great way to find out what I was missing. It's a lot of and fun. There are some dedicated tweeters who uh, will report on what mm -hmm. they're hearing in other sessions. It's a lot of fun. You can really get sucked in, though, and sort of... Uh, yeah. Yeah, but you can find all kinds of neat stuff just through serendipity as well. So, um, great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this time and, uh, and our discussion here and look forward to sharing. Well, the, uh, I'm revising the utilization-focused evaluation as we speak. I'll be coming out with a new edition this year. So if there are uh, things that you turn up in the class, either for yourself or with the students, that... Um, you would think ought to be addressed, addressed differently, updated questions, please send those to me and I'll, I'll include them in the revision. I'll be revising over the next three to four months um, and um, have already started and partway through. So uh, uh, anything you turn up that you think ought to be addressed, uh, please forward that from the students or yourself. Okay, we'll do the, the essentials book or the other, or the, the, uh, the first uh, utilization. Well, we're combining them. Ah. So instead of having the two separate ones, uh, there'll be uh, uh, this new one will probably have a subtitle that refers to the future of humanity. It will be a combination that will introduce the global emergency and make that the context for everything that uh, basically arguing that that um, uh, evaluation like everything else in the world is going to have to deal with with the, the future of humanity and the global emergency. And so this edition will be specifically framed around the role of evaluation as we face the future of humanity. That's quite a, quite a charge for us, isn't it? Yeah. All right, well, thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you, James. Bye-bye. Okay.